so uh, Ray Cartsville, uh, in his uh, law of uh, sorry, <laughs> um, so so Ray Cartsville has this law, which says that as the time goes, the rate of change of technology increases. If you look at the technology, and if you look at company, what happened to companies like Nokia, Kodak, etc., I'm sure you would, I, I agree with that assumption, and I'm sure most of you too, because we see that the technology changes faster and faster. Now to survive in these, these environments, the organizations, and also, and this, as Darwin said, the same rule apply for uh, most of the animals and humans. To survive in these uh, environments, organizations has to change. And usually it's the organizations who can change best survive these environments. Again, I'm sure this observation most of you would agree. Now, if you look at why this change happens, we would see that generally the cause of this change is emerging technologies. We see that they create new segments, they sometimes destroy existing segments and transform some of these segments. Now, if you want to look at emerging technologies and try to find, try to find what happened, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that emerging technologies are generally hard to miss. Right? They make a lot of, so lot of sound, right? It's very hard to miss them. You would see them. However, the bad news is that not all of them are created equal. For example, these show a map of some of these technologies. And you would see that some of these technologies were irrelevant. Some died. However, there are some who become part of our systems and part of our lives, almost to an extent that they are invisible. For example, XML JSON, web services, SOA ideas, right? Although we don't talk about them that much, we use them day to day. So we have, uh, as organization, we have to choose which technologies to work with, which technologies we want to invest into. Now, generally, this choice is a resource choice. right? We make these resource choices at least once a year. There may be situations we do it faster, but we make these resource choices at least once a year. So we had to decide to either to put resources into technologies or to not to put. So there are two kinds of mistakes we can make. Mistake of commission, which is that you put your resources into technology that does not end up doing something important, or put, in technology, put your resources into a technology that might not amount to anything. Also, we have to be careful not to try to do anything. Because the Porter's, Michael Porter said that strategy is a choice. It's about saying no to some things. And if you try to do everything, that means most likely you won't do anything at all. So this is a choice and an important decision we almost make every year. However, there's no standard framework to make this choice. Right? For example, if any of you and me, if we discuss certain technology, we would agree to some level, but there's a lot of detail. We would talk past each other because we don't agree what is important, what we look for, what changes, etc. So this is this work we have been doing for close to a year now. This is an effort we are trying to build a framework to look at emerging technologies and critically analyze them. Now, if you want to evaluate something, one thing generally you would do is you create a set of questions. Those questions generally force you to go into detail. 
So that was our first point. We, but we improved two more steps. One is that we tried to put these questions into a very well-defined structure. The third is that we try to represent those questions into a visual representation. Our inspiration comes from business model canvas. Uh, this, is a, this is a way to visually represent different business model. If, for example, if you are trying to do a startup, this gives you a model to represent different aspects of the business. So it's a one-page visual thing. Uh, it asks certain questions you could answer there as a structure, and when you fill it up, basically by going through different aspects, you could kind of clearly tell what happens. And of course, it, you, you had to, there are judgment there. It doesn't give you the answer. It doesn't add up things and give you an answer. However, it gives you a pretty detailed framework to stand on. So when we looked at emerging technologies, we felt there are four aspects that are very important. The first, the seat has positive drive, right? The seat has momentum. Then second, the seat has real impact. The third is that impact is feasible. The fourth, how would the technology would evolve and what are the risks it will face. So then what we did was we took these four questions and expand on them. I won't walk through everything because next slides walk through them in detail. Now, basically this, this canvas basically asks these questions and when you answer them, you could put them together to argue what might happen. For example, this is an attack created for artificial intelligence. So I, let, me, let me quickly, I'm not going to talk box by box, I'll just say the high level idea, then we'll go step by step. So what we saw was that, um, we, saw, we saw there's a lot of momentum the momentum comes from, I mean, it's, it's very hard to say this one point. I mean, you, one might say that it's the IBM D Blue or the, then the later things, et cetera. But there's, there's significant momentum. There's, uh, there's drivers in form of automation, et cetera. I'll come back to explain what they are. Uh, we see the significant impact. The impact as simple as replacing labor-intensive jobs to even to re, potentially like redefine what the intelligence means, that level of impact. We saw technical merit and challenges. There are challenges such as bias, etc. And we felt looking at the timeline, at least for the limited, some of the limited use cases, there are very concrete applications very soon, but uh, things like deep understanding, et cetera, much, be much far away. And we saw several risks. Right? So I'm, I'm just trying to give you a, some gist of how this narrative look like when you feel it. Right? So now let's go into the detail and discuss one by one. Okay, the first part, sorry, one more thing to say. This goes from left to right, top to bottom. Right? So you start with this corner, one, two, three, four then this, like that, right? So I'll start with the opportunity. So what we saw is that very often emerging technologies start with a concrete, concrete problem and a solution, and very often that evolve into a bigger situation. For example, blockchain start as a digital currency. It's only thought of as a digital currency. Of course, we later figure out there are a lot of other use cases. Okay, so uh, the players are the, who are the different players in the, at the point of time. It, I don't think it needs a lot more explanation. The drivers are forces that are naturally either help or inhibit a technology. So we were looking across many emerging technologies and we felt these 10 forces 
often affect how the imaging technologies evolve. Four of them are negative. Sorry, four of them are positive, six of them are negative. The four of them, right, among these, I think first three we discussed a lot more in the keynotes, etc. Right, the uh, cost savings, agility, automation, we know. If, if you can do it, if a technology can do it, of course, it will have a significant impact. And we see things like loose coupling. If you look through the technology, if you look from uh, monoliths to SOA to microservices, what we are trying to do is more and more, to, we try to be loosely coupled so that we can manage independently, etc. So these are the forces. Then, of course, we see there are negative forces, which is that whatever you do, if you can't find enough programmers, that's a problem, right? So you can't assume, like, uh, uh, if a technology needs PhD level, uh, like, uh, or the physicist level people, 10,000 or millions, it won't work because we don't have that many, right? So, and then we see privacy, complexity, security risk, etc. Uh, among them, the government policy and law can become both a positive and negative force. So we consider them as also as drivers, also they become risks. Right? For example, if the technology creates uh, vendor lock-in, it becomes a risk. Then now this force works against you. Now, of course, if the technology can reduce vendor lock-in, such as uh, SOA, etc., it becomes a it, this, although it's a negative force, because you can negate it, it will help you. Okay? The second is impact. So impact of a technology, we consider two classes. The first is macro. Second is micro. The macro means, sorry, the macro means what happened to the ecosystem as a whole. So one very interesting fact about the macro impact is network effects. I'm sure most of you have heard it. What the network effect means is that if the adoption of a technology le leads to more adoption of the technology or add more value to the user as the adoption increase, we say it's a network effect. So if there are network effects, I mean, the famous example is like Facebook, right? With, with 10 users in Facebook, it was very useful. But with 10,000, it's more useful. But with more million users, because there are a lot of people you can talk to, it's much more useful. So the, this kind of technologies collect momentum as they go in. To give you one other example, if you take APIs, availability of a lot of APIs make it easy to create new apps. But if you are creating a lot of new apps, it creates demand for APIs again. So it creates a positive feedback loop, which feeds on itself. So, so, so when we look at the macro impact, it's very interesting to look, see whether is there network effects, and is it possible for technology to gain critical mass? And if those two are possible, very often technology becomes unstoppable. Then we also consider things like interaction, how this new technology interacts the existing segments and exist other existing emerging technologies. What other segments this technology would disrupt? Then on the other side, at the micro impact, this is we are looking in point of in terms of organization. I think at the keynote, Massimo said, organizations look for mainly two things. They look for competitive advantage. They look for do things cheaply, or basically make more money. So can I get the competitive advantage? Can I get financial benefits? Of course, the third aspect is how would this new technology would affect the supply chain? OK, so, so these two. The, this, basically, these five factors capture impact. Next is feasibility. Now, what happens is when a technology comes and gains recognition, it kind of creates a promise. Sometimes, and this is what the Gartner hype cycle says, it sometimes overpromise. For example, if we take blockchain, the Current blockchain technology cannot live up to the promise. 
and we hope it'll, it'll catch up. Right? So the technical feasibility analyzes, can it live up to the promise? If not, does it have a chance to live up to the promise? So that's the first part. The second part is, although technology is feasible, we go and ask, does the ecosystem can support a wider deployment of that technology? Do you have enough developers? For example, what we see in big data is that although big data is very powerful, it's very impactful, it's very useful, the value is clear, it's hard to find enough data scientists who could do it at top level. So we see that it moving it move slowly. Right? So either we have to figure out tools to bridge the gap, or figure out a way to train a lot of other people. So the ecosystem is about the availability of skills, developers, and tools. And finally, most technologies have these behaviors. They are not bugs. But that's friction. It's just how it works. But the, it creates friction. For example, if you take AI, it has a lot of friction. There's like inherent bias because the way it works. And there are, I mean, there are ways to handle it, but it's complicated, right? And also because the AI potentially can replace a lot of jobs, there's a lot of mistrust. It's not really a technical problem, but there are friction. So the technical feasibility aspect ca capture these three aspects. Finally, now so far up to this point, it's basically observation. This, at, when we come here, we are trying to look to the future and make some assessments. So we ask two questions. First is, at the timeline, we ask, does the core technology is ready for at least do a reasonable amount of what is promised? If not, how fast it can? Then on the other hand, what are the risks? What are the risks that might significantly affect the way the technology is adapted? For example, let me take a, I'll just explain one scenario. So who here has heard the term superintelligence? Okay, so it's, it's a very interesting idea, right? It comes with AI. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a little bit of segue, but very interesting segue. So, the, so right, right now, the AI depends on humans for improvement. Now, humans are inefficient. We sleep, we talk, we don't work all the time. It takes years for the next version of the algorithms to come. So AI progress slowly. However, at some point, if the AI is able to progress by itself, suddenly, rate of change will significantly improve. Now, assuming the computing power is not a problem, it could be that the AI that was medical today, less than human today, might be 10,000 times better when you come back tomorrow. This is called superintelligence. We don't know whether this is possible, but it's just a theory. And we don't know what happens. If this happens, what would happen to us? Right? Because, because we cannot even think how would that technology, who is so much better than us, would see or think. Right? For example, we might think we have a kill switch, so it's not a problem. But a technology that is so many times better, might just talk to us and convince us to turn off the key switch. And it, it become, it's very hard to define the goals. Like, for example, let's say you define as protect humans. Then the AI might decide, oh, these stupid humans kill each other. Just put them in different cells and keep them separate. Right? So now I'm just taking an example. Now it's a risk. Now what we believe about this risk and how we approach this, and knowledge we know, might significantly change how the technology would progress and adopt, etc. For example, I mean, some science fiction story says that there's a 
at one point, just like a nuclear power, a nuclear uh, technology is banned, the AI can be banned if these, some of these scenarios are possible. So I have listed some of the different concepts. These are different tools you could try to use to infer into the try to future, the future. For example, one example is Rogers Five Factors, which, which basically look at five aspects, the relative advantage, compatibility, simplicity, trialability, and observability. It basically says that if you have all these five, the probability of adoption is very, very high. And you can come back from that. So I won't go through everything, but the draft, I'll talk about that later, draft has a lot more detail on how to apply these things. OK. So this is, so we, we earlier looked at AI ETAC. This is the ETAC we created for serverless. Uh, we call this ETAC as Emerging Technology Analysis Canvas. Right, so this ETAC for serverless. So we saw that the serverless is triggered by uh, Amazon Lambda, right? We, we saw that there are significant impact. And we, we saw that the technology is feasible. Although there are challenges, such as uh, cold starts, tail latencies, etc. There are a lot of use cases which can be, which can work despite these limitations. We saw that the lack of standards and vendor lock-in are cons concerns, risks. However, given the improvement, given the way the cloud computing progress, the people always saw these limitations as a trade-off. We believe that within two to five years, most of new applications would be done in serverless. Right? So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not trying to capture everything. The, so there's a draft coming very soon with a lot of detail analyzing this. I'm just trying to give you a kind of narrative, like how would this fill in and how, what kind of story you can use it to tell. Okay. So we talk about why the problem, why do we need an ETAC? Uh, we, we describe ETAC and why it's, it might be useful. So in our opinion, there are four ways you could use this. First is obviously take an imaging technology and analyze it. But we also feel it's a very powerful, uh, so one is to critically analyze, second is to brainstorm, right? If you want to think about imaging technology, you could put this together, put the labels, uh, so this is designed such a way that you could basically print this out, use Post-it note, and brainstorm, right? Also, it's a great tool. We believe it's a great tool for education and communication. For example, if you and me discuss, want, want to discuss blockchain, very often we'll talk to each other. We'll talk past each other because there are so many aspects. But if, you, if we both agree this is a good framework to start with, then we can say that, okay, we agree on these points. Okay, but I think there is this point here. I, uh, you disagree, but the, now, now that would let us uh, do the discussion in much more focused way, with a lot more detail. Let me tell a few words on uh, our experience in applying the ETAC. So we, we have done, applied this for, in detail for about four technologies. Uh, although we haven't put it out yet, we are still like, doing the fine uh, editing, etc. What we felt was that it's very useful to define the technology clearly. Because what we find out is that most of, most of the disagreement comes from not agreeing what exactly the technology means, what is included, what's not included, etc. So we felt it's useful to define the technology. Then what we did was we did the wide literature review to basically find different aspects, try to answer impact and feasibility questions. So those things become our observations and facts. Then only at the, when we come to the future section, only there we would bring in our opinion. We, are, we, we try very hard to be very objective at the top parts, of course, 
for when you look at the future, it's very hard to be objective because uh, it, it, then opinions come in. But we had to we tried very hard to keep that part separate. So this is already on GitHub. So we want to do this like an open source project. The reason it's in GitHub is we would like to get feedback, right? So please send a pull request or add a comment, drop me a mail, et cetera. We really look for feed, want feedback. We want, uh, I mean, things we would really like to have is like if you apply it to any technology, we would like to see that version. That will be interesting. So if you, if, you try, when, if you look at this, if you feel there are some aspects that it does not cover, that's another thing. Or there may be other ways to restructure this information. Right, so, so we basically the reason we want to put it on the GitHub is for, so that we can have the dialogue and we can improve, etc. We don't see it as the final version. Uh, then finally, actually we have a newsletter that you could subscribe to. So uh, the serverless uh, version is almost done. We'll get it out by November. Blockchain one is, uh, is uh, at least uh, I'm getting internal comments, so it should uh, hopefully come out December, etc. So if you want, so we will send mails to this newsletter. You can subscribe uh, when we do new new attacks or when we do updates. Uh, so that's all. Thanks very much. I can take any questions. <laughs>